Welcome to our continuing 2021 educational webinar series. I'm Catherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility, and we help manage every aspect of a compliance program and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. Today, we are so pleased to have Bob Chaput, founder and executive chairman of the Board of Clearwater, a provider of healthcare compliance and cyber risk management software and consulting services. Under his leadership, Clearwater was designated 2018's best in class for cybersecurity advisory services and ranked top compliance and risk management solution by Black Book Market Research in 2017, 18, 19, and once again in 2020. As a leading authority on healthcare compliance and enterprise cyber risk management, Chaput has supported hundreds of hospitals and healthcare systems, including Fortune 100 organizations and other federal government institutions with compliance risk management and cyber risk management. In addition to NACD Cert Cyber Risk Oversight Certificate, Chaput's professional certifications include Certified Information Systems Security Professional, CISSP, HCISPP, Certified in Risk Information Security Controls, CRISC, Certified Eth Ethical Hacker, and CIPP US. He, he is or has been a member of numerous compliance and cyber risk management focused professional associations, including NACD, CHIME, AHIS, HIMS, HCCA, ISC Squared, ISACA, and ISSA. An educator at heart, Chaput has served on the Healthcare's Most Wired Survey Governance Board, and he was a contributing co-author to an American Society of Healthcare Risk Management academic textbook on the fundamentals of risk management released in October 2017. Most recently, he has authored the book Stop the Cyber Bleeding, focused on providing senior healthcare leaders with an actionable guidance and recommendations on how to establish, implement, and mature a formal enterprise cyber risk management program. Before we begin, I would like to mention at Health First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve a trust a trusted resource for compliance professionals, and every month we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja recognition. Recently, our team has turned the spotlight on Super Ninja Jessica Bird, business manager at Wayne Radiologists. When asked what she enjoys most about working with Wayne Radiologists, Jessica said, what I enjoy most about working with Rain, Wayne Radiologists is that I got it to be involved in all aspects of the daily operations, from financials and human resources to the daily IT and clinical operations. This has given me the opportunity to learn various skill sets and develop close relationships with the employees and physicians within the organization. Congratulations, Jessica. Our team is honored to have the privilege of working with you. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We'll adjust questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There's no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. So Bob, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here. 
Well, good day, uh, Catherine. I really appreciate the warm introduction and the uh, certainly the opportunity to be here with you today and uh, all of our uh, viewers and listeners. I'd like to uh, join in, if I may, and congratulate uh, Jessica on her uh, uh, newly anointed uh, Cyber Ninja status. That's, uh, that's terrific. Congratulations, Jessica. We haven't met. We don't know each other, but uh, uh, that sounds like quite an honor. So um, appreciate, again, the, uh, the great introduction. The, uh, the topic I want to speak about today is Enterprise Cyber Risk Management. Uh, the book that was mentioned earlier uh, that's recent, I recently published called Stop the Cyber Bleeding. Uh, what C-suite executives and board members must know about enterprise cyber risk management. Uh, that's the theme today. There's several, we're obviously not going to uh, cover an entire book over the course of today's session, but there's several things I wanna zone in on. One is to uh, help all of you uh, appreciate and understand in case you don't already that the cyber attacks that uh, are occurring today are, are not a, uh, a HIPAA problem. They're not a uh, compliance issue. They're not just an information security issue. They're emerging as a pretty serious patient safety concern. And, uh, and I expect in the not too distant future, uh, potentially a medical malpractice <clears throat> lawsuit will emerge. I also want to uh, get into some of the basics around uh, cyber risk management. Uh, we're not going to go into any great depth at all, so we don't want it to scare you. It's not going to be overly technical, but I really want to focus in on the theme of, of core tenets of uh, cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and how they're connected to some really important core tenets of healthcare, which are quality and safe care, uh, timely care, and access to care. I also want to uh, help recognize that the issues that prevent um, healthcare organizations from doing uh, a good job at cyber risk management are things that we can really get our hands around. And last but not least, that we're going to discover some ways in which and talk about some ways in which we can pivot the conversation and hopefully, by way of doing so, uh, engage in a better, more business-oriented way with C-suite executives and board members. So without any further ado, let's proceed. Um, I'm asked by uh, our legal counsel to uh, put forth a couple of reminders. First and foremost, some of the subject matter uh, that we discuss in our live web events uh, covers uh, regulatory compliance, which means uh, it gets into the legal domain. We're not attorneys, we're not practicing law. We advise all of our clients to uh, receive this material in the, in the uh, vein in which it's offered, which is education, and that you seek a competent counsel as it relates to uh, compliance with any federal, state, or local regulations. The other point I'll make is all the materials are copyrighted. However, we're generally uh, quite generous in that regard. Uh, you may use these materials. We ask two things. One, that you do not remove any uh, Clearwater marks. And number two, you uh, provide appropriate attribution to Clearwater. Speaking of which, a couple of quick points about uh, the organization. I founded the organization back in 2009. We've grown uh, tremendously over the last 10 years or so. Uh, some of the awards that Catherine mentioned are indicated in the lower right on your screen. We've become a leading provider of cyber risk management services and uh, HIPAA compliance solutions for healthcare organizations. Um, we have a, a, a terrific, and I'll knock wood when I say it, so far a perfect track record when we present our work around cyber risk management, notably risk analysis work and risk management work to the Office for Civil Rights. Um, we have a 100% perfect track record in terms of their acceptance of it. Um, we became in 2018, we uh, a, a, a member of portfolio of companies that uh, are maintained by Alteris Capital Partners, a $5 billion fund focused exclusively on healthcare. So we're very well financially back. And then last but not least, we've had the good fortune of earning the trust and confidence and business of hundreds of organizations across the uh, healthcare landscape, including uh, 70 of the uh, country's largest integrated delivery networks. Um, this slide is left for the interested reader. Uh, Catherine, thank you again for the wonderful, warm introduction. Here's how I want to uh, tackle the conversation, uh, if, you, if you allow me. Um, and, and of course, I have the screen and the slides, so I guess you have to, especially because you're in viewing and listening only mode. 
Um, I want to talk about that cyber event that um, I think many organizations are worrying about when something cyber happens. Uh, get into a little bit of the conversation about what I'm talking about when I refer to cyber bleeding. As I mentioned a moment ago, talk about some basics around cyber risk. Uh, get to a point of discussing that not only is this subject matter, cyber risk management, not an IT problem, but moreover, it can actually become a business enabler. And then last but not least, given the above, where do we go from here? And I'll leave you with some thoughts um, uh, is, uh, is, is items that you can action as part of this session. Um, what you see on the uh, screen, Catherine referred to, and I mentioned as well, the book that I recently published called Stop the Cyber Bleeding, What Healthcare Executive Board Members Must Know About um, Enterprise Cyber Risk Management. And you'll probably uh, henceforth hear me refer to that as ECRM. Um, this book is a call to arms. This book is all about uh, providing healthcare leaders, uh, specifically the C-suite uh, members and board uh, members with the ability to better provide leadership and oversight in this particular area. And so I open up the book and I rarely read slides, but I'm going to read a little bit from the book to set the stage for the conversation here today. And so I open in chapter one, when something cyber happens, <clears throat> and I quote our fundamental uh, mantra in healthcare, first do no harm attributed to Hippocrates, with a chapter entitled The Attack. And it reads as follows, Mrs. Smith, a polarizing politician, has a cough. Her voice is hoarse, and she's also been feeling tired and weak. She's been a little off in her recent public, public appearances, so much so that the media has been speculating about what health issues she might be dealing with. She visits an internist in your organization. The internist orders a regular non-SAT TT, CT scan. However, unbeknownst to the hospital, your hospital, a hacker's already infiltrated the radiology department network. The evening before Mrs. Smith's CT scan, when janitorial staff entered the building a clean, uh, to clean, a man slipped into the radiology department and placed a man-in-the-middle device on the network near the CT scanner. It took only seconds for him to position this simple device, and, which enables a wireless access point to your network. With a device in place, the hacker is able to intercept and modify CT scan images. And it's fairly easy to do since the transmission of these images between CT scanner and your PAC system is not encrypted, which is really typically the case. Um, the hacker uses his access to erase evidence of cancerous nodules from Mrs. Smith's CT scan. When the radiologist reviews the modified scan, he reviews no evidence of, of tumors. He forwards his analysis to Mrs. Smith's internist. Her physician calls her with the good news. The CT scan shows no evidence of cancer. Because of the misdiagnosis, Mrs. Smith's lung cancer goes untreated. She dies within a year. Her family files a medical malpractice lawsuit against her organization. Far-fetched? Well, that's the question. I would like to submit to you that this is not only far-fetched, but furthermore, to let you know in a moment that this has actually been demonstrated in a research study in a lab environment. So can you imagine the local newspaper saying, hack CT image at Gotham, Gotham Memorial results in cancer misdiagnosis and death. What would that mean for your organization? probably a medical malpractice hearing. And then the question would come up, well, what was the clinician's liability here? What's the executive and board's duty of care? Were they exercising reasonable diligence? Remember the HIPAA security rule, while a little long in the tooth and dated, requires organizations to safeguard the confidentiality, the integrity, the availability of all of this information. There was a duty to, uh, that was owed to this particular patient. The duty was breached. Uh, the breach caused this individual to suffer, in fact, to die. And actual harm occurred because Mrs. Smith, even though a polarizing politician, is off the playing field. This would typically constitute the basis of, or at least an argument to examine whether or not there's a medical malpractice lawsuit. 
This is not typically what we think about when we think about uh, cybersecurity or when we think about uh, the HIPAA security rule. And so the question is, is this even possible? And I would suggest to you that it truly is. Uh, there's a, a slide here <clears throat> that actually has a screen grab of a YouTube video that provides the highlights of um, the study that I mentioned earlier that was performed at Ben Gurion University in Israel back in late 2018, published in a research paper in 2019. This is not the one and only demonstration of proof of concept that has been done that has demonstrated that bad things can happen by hacking into computer networks and, and compromising the integrity of patient information. In fact, one of the questions that comes up, if I may advance my screen, how can this possibly happen? <clears throat> well, I'm just gonna clip the waves here, but I do have some references and some hot links if you wanna uh, dig a little bit deeper. The first headline is that many, many studies have shown that misdiagnosis is the most common reason for medical malpractice lawsuits. Another study has shown that second only to primary care docs, radiologists are typically the individuals who are missing these diagnoses. And then last but not least, the same research paper I mentioned a moment ago, not only did it demonstrate that cancerous modules could be removed or cancerous modules could be inserted into a CT scan. It further went on to demonstrate that these fake CT scan images could be used to fool or trick trained experienced radiologists. And all the data and facts and the background around that are there. Well, we don't have to go back to that research world. Think about some recent cases. Uh, in September of 2020 in Dusseldorf, Germany, a university was actually attacked and unintentionally a hospital affiliated with the university ended up being subjected to a ransomware attack that basically disabled or made unavailable systems and data and devices throughout that hospital. As a result of that, a woman presented herself in the emergency room and was turned away because she couldn't be treated. There was no access to appropriate equipment, devices, and her information. She was diverted to another hospital 20 miles away. She ended up dying. Now, I'm gonna leave it to the experts to come up with the real cause of death in that case. And I know subsequent to the event, there's been some analysis that said, well, really, was it the result, direct result of that ransomware attack, or was it something else? Fast forward, fast forward the tape a little bit, only a month or so, September, October timeframe in 2020, we had Universal Health Services, which operates all over the country and in the United Kingdom, had was subjected to a ransomware attack. The reports in the press cited the fact that every single computer throughout that health system was compromised in some way. Now, whether there were deaths or not emanating from that. Um, I did a presentation not so long ago with Dr. Benoit Desjardins, who's an esteemed radiologist at Penn Medicine. And in the presentation, uh, Benoit cited the fact that there were four deaths that may be attributed to delays in lab results or uh, in some other way affected by the attack. And then slightly more recently, um, in October of this year, a UVM Health Network, University of Vermont Health Network, has been subjected to an attack. And as of this recording, well, it's still a pretty mysterious as to what actually happened there. The FBI is involved, the Vermont the Cyber Division of the National Guard was called in. Um, most recent reports that I've read have indicated that the system was losing $1.5 million a day in revenue as a result of the attack. But more importantly, chemotherapy patients were turned away and literally left in the dark as a result of this particular attack. So we don't have to look very far to find uh, bad things that are happening that go beyond the fact that somebody accesses my records and comes to understand I had my tonsils out when I was five years old. It's a much more serious game than that. And so, 
I use the phrase cyber bleeding in the title of my book, and many people have said to me, what, what's up with that? Well, here's the deal. We have, um, as a result of this massive blitzkrieg digital transformation that's occurred in healthcare, we have created some unintended consequences. And so in my preface to the book, I define or explain cyber bleeding as the pain and loss, the harm our patients are experiencing as a result of these unintended consequences. The transformation, the digitization in healthcare has been transformational. What we've not had is an attendant transformation when it comes to enterprise cyber risk management. I was talking to a CIO of a pretty significant health system, well, hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, the usual lineup of clinics, et cetera. And he puffed his chest out and he said to me very proudly, I'm managing a $50 million Cerner implementation project. And I said, wow, that's terrific. You know, another badge of honor, get, get the gentleman ready for the next assignment in an even bigger health system. I said, well, sir, how much of that $50 million has been allocated to cyber risk management, cyber security, to understanding what the issues are as you implement these new systems. And he was taken aback and looked quizzically at me. And the answer, I'm sad to report, was none. This cyber bleeding is happening as a result of the electronic health record stampede that's been going on as a result of the High Tech Act, a major enhancement of uh, other administrative systems and decision support systems, explosion of biomedical devices that now are connected to the network and including up to and including the internet and either attached to or implanted in our patients. And then concomitant with that, we have the deployment of all sorts of internet of things, IOT, and building management systems upon which our healthcare data systems and devices depend. We're building a bit, sadly, of a house of cards here that has with it many, many exposures. And the sad part of it is we've not had the same concomitant attention to and investment in enterprise cyber risk management. We need to, we're overdue. For many, many years, I've been talking about the need for this transformation. And, uh, and I'll go back to roughly the time of the High Tech Act. As you may recall, it was part of the uh, stimulus bill, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act of 2009, uh, published in the Federal Register in February of 2009. Around that time, we had a bundle of carrots in the form of $33 billion of incentive money to healthcare organizations to go out and implement those EHR systems, and we had a bundle of sticks. Around that time, as it related to cybersecurity and risk management, many organizations, not all of them, were awakened to the fact that the Office for Civil Rights was getting a little bit more serious about enforcing the HIPAA regulations. I call that phase one or era one, the era of compliance, circa 2010. Fast forward the tape a little bit. We arrive around 2015. In fact, the year was 2015. I call it the year of the mega breaches. Anthem, 78 million. Primera, Primera uh, I think it was 11 million. Excellus, tens of millions. Care First, tens of millions. I think when you added them all up in 2015, we had over 150 million electronic health records impermissibly disclosed. At this moment in time, organizations were awakened to, whoa, this is not just about the Office for Civil Rights and complying with HIPAA, this is getting to be a serious security problem. Let's take a step forward, 2018, all of these devices I mentioned before, whether it's a pacemaker, uh, or whether it's uh, someone with a dialysis, a pump that's attached to them, uh, devices are now containing chips that are connected to the network for good reasons, for remote monitoring purposes. With this, we enter a period of a potential hack on those devices. If I'm in a recovery room, I've got a morphine IV pump on a wireless IV infusion pump, is it possible for somebody to hack into that device and dial up the morphine dosage and kill me? Absolutely, unequivocally. Good news, not good. I don't know of that happening at this point in time. 
And then last but not least, where I think this is going to go as those attacks manifest themselves and can be proven, I think we're about to see cyber-driven medical malpractice lawsuits, medical professional liability or hospital professional liability. This is the evolution that we've gone to, and I'll come back and hearken to my uh, point in the headline of this slide. We really need a transformation when it comes to enterprise cyber risk management. Uh, in the book, in one of my chapters, I quote uh, Mike Myatt, the uh, source is down below, the primary focus and responsibility of a board is governance. And broken down to its essence, governance is all about patient safety and mitigation. So in this book, I try to deliver some core messages in the form of the context. Ladies and gentlemen of the C-suite and of the board, this is not an IT problem. This is a patient safety, a medical malpractice lawsuit issue. This therefore is a serious I developed some important themes around what the role of the board and the C-suite should be. And the punchline here is that we're not expecting or anticipating the board to become experts in cybersecurity. They're not going to be asked to use crypto jacking in a sentence or anything like that. Their responsibility is to set the tone, provide the leadership and provide the oversight to ensure that expectations are set in the organization that this is a serious business risk management issue. And last but not least in the book, I put forth some recommended best practices, many of which, most of which are centered around a compendium of important affordable free materials that are available from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And the little icon that appears there happens to stand for the NIST uh, approach to uh, their so-called cybersecurity uh, framework. So um, the next thing I want to do is speaking of, of the risk management basics, let's get back to this idea of, so what is our core responsibility? And when I say our, I put forth in the book the idea that this is a team sport. It's not an IT problem. It's not a privacy officer problem. It's not a compliance officer problem. This is a team sport, our core responsibility. When it comes to all of these data, and I use the uh, uh, acronym EPHI, Electronic Protected Health Information, the myriad of those biomedical devices and all the information systems that I alluded to earlier, what are our responsibilities? Well, they center around three things. One is confidentiality. What if your or my, let's make it personal, sensitive information is impermissibly is disclosed. Could bad things happen as a result of that? Absolutely unequivocally. I'll talk about some of those in a moment. What if these data systems or devices have been modified or changed in some way? What if someone hacks into that Cerner system, gets to my uh, electronic health record, changes my blood type the night before I'm going in for surgery? If I need a transfusion the next morning, that modification, which is called a compromise of integrity, could result, if I'm administered the wrong blood type, could result in a death up to an inclined, if not a more serious, a less serious harm. And then last but not least, unless you've been on an interplanetary space mission for the last 10 years, you've probably heard of something called ransomware. Today's modern day version or modern day method for rendering data systems and devices unavailable. And the attacks that I talked about earlier, whether it was in Dusseldorf, Germany, or United Health uh, Services, or at UVM Medical Center, when this information is not available at a critical time, it could result in bad things happening to our patients. The fundamental objective, our core responsibility, is to avoid the compromise of confidentiality and or integrity and or availability. And in this slide, I'll just quickly build it out. What are some of the bad things that can happen if you compromise the confidentiality? That is, if someone's very personal, intimate information is impermissibly disclosed. Well, it could be identity theft, it could be medical identity theft, it might result in reputational damage, it might result in relationship damage, 
there may be an adverse employment decision that's made as a result of someone knowing about my health situation that they ought not know. Uh, it might result in my developing anxiety, depression, and ultimately committing suicide. There was an attack uh, several years ago. There wasn't actually an attack. It was a mistake, a mailing that was done by Aetna announcing a new formula, uh, formulary entry for uh, HIV patients. And the window on the envelope that was sent out actually included those words, your new HIV medicine. I mean, this is like people in the neighborhood now know that an individual has, uh, has AIDS. If there's a compromise of integrity, somebody changes my blood type, somebody hacks into um, a system and uh, changes the dosage of a prescription, Additionally, bad things that can, hap can happen. I'm not going to enumerate or discuss each one of them. And finally, the compromise of availability, the ransomware attack, delayed admissions, patients being deferred to hospitals that can't treat them or dying along the way, a diagnosis treatments. Bad things can happen. Our job when it comes to enterprise cyber risk management at its very fundamental core is to avoid the compromise. So remember, the importance of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But let's take that a little further and think about some of the three, think about the three core tenets of healthcare today. We want to deliver to our patients quality and safe care. We want to make sure that they have access to care. And we want to make sure that there is timely care. And I would suggest to you that if I uh, if we conduct a conversation about how the compromise of confidentiality could affect quality and safe care, access to care, and timely care, that would be a pretty robust conversation. Similarly, if we compromise, modify, delete, or change someone's protected health information, could that have an effect on those three core tenants? Absolutely. And of course, if we compromise the availability of the information or the data or the devices. This matter, by the way, at the very bottom of the slide is a link to a white paper I wrote on this subject called Connecting the Dots Between Cyber Risk and Patient Safety. It's about the data, the systems and devices, of course, at a very fundamental level, but additionally, it's about patient safety and medical professional liability. That's one of the key points that I wanna drive home today and one of the key points that I try to drive home in the book. As a consequence of this, this is not an IT problem. This is a business risk management problem. In fact, if we take and think about this subject matter, it really breaks down into two parts. Yes, it's a risk management issue on the one hand, but I would submit to you that organizations that have the most progressive, most proactive enterprise cyber risk management programs in place are leveraging those programs to be a business enabler. What do I mean by that? Think about some of the things that your C-suite or board are worried about on a day in day out basis. They include worry about your financials, worried about the organization's reputation, worried about merger and acquisition activity, whether you're acquiring or potentially becoming acquired, and they're worrying about competition. Not only the traditional competition, which I'll speak about more in a moment, but also some so-called technology invaders. And I think what we have here is an opportunity if we pivot this conversation over to one involving business issues, we have a real opportunity to lever the discussion about enterprise cyber risk management to a higher plane. Here's what I mean by that, and hopefully my graphic portrays the point. If we can engage with our C-suite and board about the financials of our organization, if we can engage in conversations about competition, if we can engage in, comp in conversations about reputation, if we can engage in conversations about merger and act Activity, merger and acquisition activity, I think we're going to be able to lever up the whole conversation about enterprise cyber risk management. The point is that it is twofold, both a risk management issue and a business enablement issue. What do I mean? A couple of things about financials. 
um, start talking to your organization about protecting the balance sheet. Listen, the, the case I mentioned a moment ago, University of Vermont uh, health system, losing $1.5 million a day. Uh, what's offsetting that? There were, by the way, 300 individuals who were furloughed as a result of that cyber attack. So there's some hedging being done, but otherwise the source of those losses is probably a drawdown on the balance sheet. The other thing I would suggest you think about um, is the cost of capital. All organizations, including healthcare organizations, need capital in order to offer new services, in order to grow. You go out into the marketplace to seek capital. The three biggest credit rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, have all articulately declared that they are building cyber risk management considerations into an organization's uh, credit rating. In fact, many of you are aware of the Equifax uh, breach, mega breach that occurred several years ago. Uh, Standard & Poor's ended up downgrading Equifax's credit ratings. I can't remember, they went from a AAA to a BB, uh, B uh, level as a result of that. What's that mean? When Equifax now goes out to seek capital for growth initiatives, they're gonna pay a lot more for that. That's a business conversation that can be headed off by engaging in uh, a stronger enterprise cyber risk management program. There's another matter, uh, reducing your liability insurance costs. Most organizations have a chief risk officer, if not the CFO responsible for directors and officers, general liability, cyber liability, et cetera. There's usually a whole uh, portfolio, errors and omissions, et cetera. Uh, we've worked with a number of organizations that have looked at that insurance portfolio in the interrelationship with their cyber liability plan. And they've studied and examined and looked for gaps and clashes and any redundancies that have occurred. The upshot of which has been, and I give a couple of case studies around this in my book, the upshot has been that organizations are able to have better limits, uh, better insurance overall, and lower premiums and or lower premiums by working on this. This is a business conversation. And your insurance company for sure is assessing your posture as it relates to cyber risk management when they when they quote any premium for you. The next matter is competition. Before I show the technology invaders, let me just talk about it from a traditional point of view. Worked with a client, a Midwest large health system, uh, had uh, the dubious distinction of having uh, three breaches reported to the Office for Civil Rights within a nine-month period of time as is required by the, uh, uh, the breach notification rule. You have to notify all the individuals who were affected. You have to notify Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, and you have to notify all major media outlets, radio, TV, and print, which they did. And of course, people typically try to put out bad news on a Friday afternoon, but they put the information out. And uh, the next week, their competitor down the street, I won't name names, launched a full-on public relations campaign that attacked this health system and said, how could you possibly entrust your health to this organization when they can't even take care of your healthcare information? So that's what's happening from a traditional co competitive point of view. But now enter, it's expected by the year 2028 that healthcare will be a $6 trillion industry in the United States. Guess who wants a piece of that pie? Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, uh, uh, Lyft, uh, Uber, uh, technology companies that you typically wouldn't think of as, uh, as invading our space. Uh, these are non-traditional uh, competitors who are entering, and guess what they can do pretty well? They're not perfect, but they've got their arms around as global organizations, the cyber risk management thing, in a pretty, pretty comfortable way. Have a conversation with your C-suite and board about competition. And then it comes to reputation. A uh, very famous quote, Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to destroy it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Well, guess what? Uh, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Buffett, uh, it, it's not uh, five minutes, it's probably five nanoseconds right now. It's that errant keystroke, it's that hack from a foreign nation state 
that can be a game changer for you. Where does your organization stand from the point of view of protection by way of a robust enterprise cyber risk management program vis-a-vis -vis protecting your reputation? Uh, there was a study that was done, a so-called uh, 2019 Healthcare Reputation Report, that actually showed a positive correlation, if not causation, between higher revenues per bed for hospitals vis-a-vis uh, -vis the reputation. In other words, higher reputation translated into higher revenues per bed. So this is, uh, reputation is playing into it as well. And then last but not least, whether you are an acquirer or potentially being acquired, we worked with another different large healthcare system that acquired a smaller one. And uh, when the deal closed, what they found out was that the smaller one was uh, subjected to it, not then disclosed, shame on them, had been subjected to an OCR enforcement action. This cost the acquiring organization uh, lots of out-of-pocket expense that was unbudgeted to remedy the situation and go through the OCR investigation process and take appropriate remediation actions. You don't want to be surprised. You want to have a strong enterprise uh, cyber risk management program in place. While not in uh, healthcare, uh, many of you are aware, or some of you are aware, that Yahoo was acquired by Verizon several years ago. And as a result of Yahoo having data breaches that went as far back as 2013 and 2014, that ended up slashing about $350 million off of the valuation on that company. In other words, shareholders paid for $350 million uh, as a result, paid $350 million as a result of those breaches. So the whole point here, financials, reputation, competition, M&A. These are just four of a number of business topics can, that can be brought into the conversation around enterprise cyber risk management. So with that, I'll leave you with a couple of uh, final thoughts. Uh, what would I do if, uh, if I were about to uh, uh, step into a new role and uh, take on this work? Number one, Absolutely unequivocally, if your board and C-suite is not engaged, I'd strike up the conversation in business terms along the lines I just mentioned and get the board engaged. Uh, it's so important to have oversight and governance in place. Number two, I would start building out my enterprise cyber risk management program. I alluded to and covered uh, to some length at some length in the book. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, a plethora of resources that are available. I would start building my program around NIST for a whole variety of reasons. Too numerous to enumerate right here. And then last but not least, what most organizations, is probably the single biggest failing that I see most organizations struggle. They don't really understand what their exposures are. As a result of that, they're in this mode of tactical, technical spot welding firefighting with no coherent business-oriented architectural approach to this. If you're going to put together an enterprise cyber risk management program, at some point in time, you need to put a stake on the ground and really understand what your exposures are. And you can do that by starting with your so-called crown jewels, your most critical, if you will, information assets. So with that, uh, Catherine, I'm gonna actually take a breath and uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity again today and turn things back over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Bob. That was a really wonderful webinar. And we do have a few uh, questions here, so. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. I'm ready and I, and I do see that you have, a, um, uh, you have a placeholder showing on the screen, so we're good to go. All right, so um, you refer to NIST, and I know you're a big NIST advocate. Why does NIST provide such a good set of tools for enabling an enterprise cyber risk management approach? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a great question. Uh, I have been, and you're right, I fully expect to continue to be a big NIST uh, advocate. Why NIST? Um, there, there are many solid reasons. Um, <laughs> 
as I said a moment ago, almost too numerous to mention here, but let me give you some of the top. First of all, the NIST approach delivers some critical building blocks to establishing your program. Among them, the NIST cybersecurity framework, which has been proven and is widely adopted across numerous industries, including healthcare. It also brings a process that's documented in a number of so-called NIST special publications. A second reason is that um, it's been developed using an open, inclusive process that has engaged hundreds of organizations in and outside of government, uh, which is different from an approach taken by certain commercial models. Um, a third, um, it doesn't require an expensive and oftentimes meaningless certification. I'd be very cautious about uh, approaches that, that do that. Um, I love it because it facilitates my reason number four, uh, information governance. That is, it facilitates the engagement of the C-suite and board. Uh, I also like it a lot, as I mentioned, because uh, it's very affordable. Uh, it's free. <laughs> and so, uh, and then I'll, I'll serve up last but not least, um, in healthcare, it's been endorsed by HIMSS, uh, Healthcare Information Management System Society. Uh, surveys have shown that it's the most widely adopted in healthcare. So um, lots and lots of reasons for it. Um, I, I detail them out even further uh, in the book, but uh, I'll leave you with those as some key reasons. Okay, great, great. So um, you had mentioned the um, OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, and a, rec a recent string of settlement announcements by the OCR suggest that healthcare organizations continue to struggle with meeting the requirement for risk analysis, analysis and risk management. Why has security risk analysis requirement been such a challenge for the industry? Yes, you're right. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, the string of announcements and the data is very compelling, <laughs> unfortunately, in a bad way. Um, there have been some 90 cases um, that OCR has pursued. 60 of those cases, which are relevant to our conversation, have involved electronic protected health information. And as the Office for Civil Rights has asked those organizations to submit their risk analysis and risk management uh, plans, 53 of the organizations had adverse findings or failures when it came to risk analysis. That's like 88%. It's just phenomenal to me, mm. especially um, where are we? Uh, 2003 was when the security rule was put in place. So 17 years later um, and uh, uh, 11 years after the High Tech Act, which allegedly put more teeth into it, just astounding. And 80% of those organizations had failures when it came to risk management. So why is it such a challenge is the question you asked. Well, first of all, there's a lack of understanding uh, in terms of what's really required. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's been spread around about what risk analysis is. And it, it's a little bit um, uh, befuddling of, for me because OCR has been very, very clear on what they're looking for. Um, another reason is that it, why it's been such a big challenge is that it's a big job. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and there's a lack of uh, skills and knowledge and experience. Um, however, you know, like most big job, once it's done, you, one can then move into maintenance and enhancement modes, if you will. And then last but not least, um, there's a lack of tools. And we see so many organizations struggling to do it with Excel spreadsheets. And I'll tell you, um, pardon me if this sounds a little indelicate, that's about as crazy as trying to build your electronic health record system using Excel. Uh, you need to look for software solutions and automation. And, and by the way, it's something on which we've prided ourselves in developing and offering. Great, great, okay. All right, you emphasized in the presentation that Enterprise Cyber Risk Management, ECRM, is not an IT pro, uh, problem, but an enterprise risk management issue and handled well, rather a business enabler. What advice do you have on how to engage the C-suite and board 
in a productive ongoing dialogue about how to turn cyber risk management into um, a business enabler. Great um, <clears throat> question, and we and we talked about it a little bit, and and I'll add hopefully a little bit uh, more to what we covered uh, in the slides. Um, the punchline is um, start talking business. Um, yes, at some point, at some level in the organization, there needs to be conversations about uh, attacks. There need to be conversations about vulnerability. Uh, assessments, there need to be conversations about things called penetration testing. Don't drag that stuff into the C-suite or in front of the board. Get back to some of the things I mentioned before. Start talking business, financials, lowering the cost of capital, lowering insurance premiums, reputation, you know, the Warren Buffett quote, uh, the, the higher the study that I mentioned, higher revenues per bet, competition. Remember, that we have our traditional competitors and we also have our non-traditional technology invaders and have a conversation with your executives about whether, you're, uh, whether a strong um, enterprise cyber risk management program can be leveraged to put you in a better competitive position. And then uh, last but not least, I mentioned uh, M&A. And whether you're a buyer of organizations or a seller, um, you don't wanna be caught short without a strong posture around cyber risk management. Okay, great, great. So um, aside from roles as CEO and COO, I know that earlier in your career, you served both as a CIO and CISO in healthcare organizations in the past. So given the state, um, the current state of affairs with healthcare cybersecurity, if you're cast into the role of CISO in a large healthcare system, what would be your top two to three priorities if you were in that role? Wow. So what, um, yeah, what would you recommend, want, basically? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that role today. <laughs> I'm enjoying my life as it is. And uh, that would be a pretty painful place. But um, I guess what I'll go back to is uh, something I, I highlight in the book. Um, if this is really going to be a transformational effort, uh, we have to think about governance, uh, people, process, technology, and engagement. In other words, five key core capabilities that the organization has to build over time. And this is a journey, um, uh, it's not a destination. It doesn't happen quickly. So if I think about those five things, the first thing that I would do strategically is I would work very hard to put governance in place. In fact, under no circumstances would I ever probably take a CISO job at this point, but under no circumstances would I take one without explicit written assurances from the C-suite and from the board that they are going to get behind this program. Number one, uh, and, and, and by the way, part of that, uh, have them commit to overseeing the whole process of taking stock where we are and overseeing activities going forward. Secondarily, this gets to something I wrapped up the presentation with, um, I, would, I would move forward on uh, implementing, adopting the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework and also the NIST processes for doing uh, risk analysis, risk management work. Uh, this is perhaps going to sound like alphabet soup, but there's NIST special publication 800-30 around risk analysis, 800-37, 800-39. There's a core set that I would adopt and begin to implement. And then last but not least, and I mentioned this before, um, get the risk analysis done. In the absence of understanding one's exposures, what I see a lot of organizations today is they go to the uh, security checklist supermarket and they find a checklist of things they should do and they just start, damn the torpedoes, throw caution to the wind, they just start doing it. And what you're going to end up with in that particular case is you're going to do implement things you don't need and you're going to underinvest in things that are really critical to you. So um, those are the things I would do. Number one, get governance in place. Number two, start formalizing the process work. And number three, 
uh, get a very, very fundamental core requirement, the risk analysis done as soon as practical. Okay, all right, great advice. Um, and speaking of advice, do you have um, any other words of advice or anything that you wanted to leave with us today? I think the, um, we, we've hit all the key points today, uh, Catherine. If, if you don't mind, I'll put in an, an unabashed and unashamed plug <laughs> for, for my book. It's available on Amazon and uh, soft copy, uh, or sh I should say hard copy version, electronic version, and also an audible version. So uh, if, if these ideas uh, resonated with you and if you feel that um, uh, you can further leverage some of these thoughts and ideas, uh, uh, please feel free to use my book as a, uh, as a guidepost as you work through this journey. Great, wonderful, wonderful. And um, I wanted to let our listeners know as well, or our uh, webinar attendees um, uh, know as well, that um, to remind them or to just let you know if, if you um, weren't aware that um, uh, that I have a, a radio show and um, slash podcast called First Talk Compliance, and that uh, Bob is going to, is my guest currently um, it started yesterday, which would um, which would be um, February eighth, um, and it's on. You can find it on healthcarenowradio.com, uh, and so it, again, it's called First Talk Compliance, and so um, that that show can be found um, there, and. Uh, then it can also be found um, then uh, on our website eventually, and then also on anywhere that you get your your um, your podcasts. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that, uh, and you can find information on our website, um, and then on um, you know LinkedIn, Facebook, um, on our Instagram page, uh, Twitter, all kinds of things like that too. So um, be on the lookout for that. Uh, please use the contact information on um, that was on the screen there um, uh, for um, uh, for Bob Shaput. Uh, and if you have any more questions, you make sure that you've downloaded a copy of the um, a PDF of the slides for the handouts. Um, and there'll be more information about any other, um, you know, uh, webinars and uh, uh, events with them. Um, and then also, uh, don't forget that uh, you can attend um, webinars and find more information on webinars with us um, at firsthcc.com. Don't forget, um, if you have questions, uh, further questions, you can send them to us also, and we'll forward them on to Bob. Um, please remember your PACOM and your PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. Um, Bob, I wanted to thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, and um, I wanted to remind our attendees again, you can register for future webinars for first a, uh, for first healthcare compliance or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.